Hi, and welcome to another Tech Explorations podcast episode. I'm the host, Peter Delmaris, an online educator and maker, author of Maker Education Revolution and founder at Tech Explorations. And in this session, my special guest is John Evans. John is an electrical engineer and open source software developer based in Boston. Since around 2011, John has been designing electronics and firmware for industrial and consumer products, and most recently in the 3D printing industry. He's been a contributor to the KeyCard EDA project since 2016 and a member of the lead developer team since 2018. And he's also created several smaller open source projects related to LED art installations. In this conversation, we'll take a look at John as a maker, engineer and open source project contributor, how he started and how he got where he is now. John, welcome to the podcast. How are you today? Great. Thanks, Peter. Glad to be here. So uh, this is uh, the second time that we have a chat in about four weeks. Uh, first one being uh, the your presentation at the Makers Summit. I'm not sure <laughs> what the order of you know the, the release of the podcast versus the summit is going to be, which one is going to be first, but I'm putting that in there for the record. Um, and um, I'm actually excited because this chat that we're about to have is more open-ended it's more about you as a maker as and as an engineer rather for you to uh, you know produce a formal presentation and teach us something new so uh, i hope you're ready for that Mm -hmm. yeah bring it on okay so let's start from the beginning uh would you like to take a few minutes and tell us a little bit about your background you can go as far back as you like when you were a kid maybe tell us an interesting story about what caused you i guess what uh, influenced you or inspired you to become an engineer and then we'll follow the thread from that point forwards towards now in time sure So I was always one of those kids who was tinkering with things, but I think when I really got serious about making and engineering was in in primary school, I got involved with these robotics competitions where we had, uh, you know, every year a set task to accomplish and a short period of time to build a robot and then compete with it. And I think that sort of opened my eyes to a lot of different engineering disciplines, but also that I was personally interested in seeing the big picture and, and, and sort of playing with all of them. You know, it involved mechanical engineering and electronics and software and a number of other disciplines like that. So that definitely got me thinking about where I wanted to go, but I knew it was going to be related to engineering somehow. Yeah. So based on the work that I did there and what I had the most fun with, I ended up going into electrical engineering in, in college. And from there, uh, got my you know first job working as an electrical engineer at the time, working on industrial products. And I think what I've carried through from the beginning when I was just playing with robots is that I really like to understand the full system, whether I happen to be working on a, a software component or a, an electronic circuit or something like that. I like to see the end product to be able to see you know, the robot move around or to see whatever the final output is and know all of the different moving parts that go together in that and and where what I'm working on is fitting into that big picture. Yeah, it's quite interesting. So there's two interesting things here. First, I actually want to go back to those days uh, where you build your robot at school and uh, just took a bit uh, about a few specifics, like what kind of robot was it? What was the class like? Are uh, you a teacher? And whether it was like a team activity or were you uh, working on it solo? But the other thing that, <laughs> that's Einstein the dog. Um, the other thing that is, <laughs> dude. <laughs> okay. But the other thing that uh, is interesting is the fact that at, at that early, you know, um, um, the early experience that you had with a robot, you saw it as a system, not just like the individual components, but uh, how they all went together and worked together to produce the final moving working robot. So let's touch about, uh, let's touch on systems in a minute, but could you give us some specifics first about that robot that you built back then? What was it like? Uh, was, it like a, was it like a STEM program that was implemented in your school or something else? Just so that we know where you started. Yes. Uh, so this 
this was a program called First Robotics. I'm, I'm not sure uh, if you're yeah. familiar with it or not, but it, it started out at the time that I did it. I'm not sure how much international presence it had, if any, but it it was a, a sort of a nationwide program, uh, it's still going today, I should say, yeah, uh, of uh, getting mostly high school students involved in robotics as an extra, extracurricular activity. So there wasn't a, a teacher or a class but we did have uh, a, you know, a group of volunteer mentors that we found from, from the community. Some of them were the parents of some of my classmates. Some of them were local engineers who were volunteering their time in the evenings and weekends. And the, the challenge that would be posed every year was some kind of a game that the robot would have to play. And they, they would change the rules every year and you wouldn't know about it until the start of the competition. Hmm. So you could, as you as you did it for multiple years you could build up some knowledge about generally what works and what doesn't work but there's also an element of part of the fun of it is they try to make it so that every year you have to solve new problems not just uh, learning how to program or learning how to put together a robot out of parts but also what is what is the right solution to the engineering challenge that they unveil uh, whether it's you know getting the robot to uh, move in a specific way or manipulate an object, play with a ball, things like that. Uh, there was a lot of variety and so it was always nice to have a fresh challenge. So we did have a team of people, but they were all, you know, students with various backgrounds and, and often we would be mostly self-taught, but learning from a combination of, you know, community mentors and internet forums and things like that. It was very DIY. We had to do a lot mm -hmm. of uh, a lot of figuring that out ourselves. Uh, yep. Um, actually, uh, I am uh, next next week. Uh, next week, I am a judge in one of those competitions here in in Sydney. There's um, there's a competition happening where the format is very similar to what you described. So the, it runs over two days. The first day, oh, well, the teams have already started uh, learning the technology based on the uh, resources that we've given uh, to the students, but they don't yet know what the challenges are going to be. So they hear about the challenges on the day of the competition. The day before the competition is like a warm-up day where um, they all assemble at the hall where the competition is taking place and they look around and see how it's constructed and then they set up the, the, um, you know, the, uh, the team on the ground and uh, all their equipment. And the next day in the morning, we give them the, the problem and everybody then have to solve it. They've got a, the rest of the day to solve it. Uh, I think that's something like uh, what you've gone through, right? You, you, a few, yeah. you had to work for a few months before you get to that point though. Yes, yes. And it's always, always interesting seeing the kind of creativity that comes out of that situation where there's just so many different ways to solve a problem. And when yeah. you're in, in the thick of it, trying to make your solution work, that's all you can think about. But then you go to the competition and you see all these other people who've come up with different solutions and it's yeah. really can be uh, inspiring. Yeah. Could you tell us a bit about the, the team? Like uh, you, you, you mentioned that it was uh, a diverse team in terms of the, the skill sets that the team members brought into the team. So uh, what kind of um, backgrounds did your teammates have in terms of, uh, I'm not talking so much about um, uh, ethnicity and all that, but I'm talking about the skill sets that they brought in. Well, I think, uh, you know, trying, trying to think back to this, it was a, a long time ago. We definitely had people who had different interests and talents. Some of them were people who were already familiar with working with their hands. Maybe they had uh, worked on repairing cars or, or, or yeah. building things out of wood or things like that. Uh, some of them, you know, taught themselves how to program at home. Some of them had very few pre-existing skills but just had a lot of excitement and passion and, and ability to think through problems. And so it was interesting to give those people in particular an opportunity to actually get their hands on uh, so, some of the tools and, and, um, and, and, and actually start building those skills. And often we would have a situation where we had some experienced people and some new people. And if we could get them excited about the competition and participating in building a robot early enough, 
then we had time to actually teach each other things through uh, you know little little projects or messing around with past year's robots or things like that before yeah. the actual competition started. Yeah, so there's uh, quite a lot, quite a lot of time for and an opportunity to to tinker around. Like you mentioned, playing around with last year's robot because this year you'd have to build something new, right? But you can learn from what previous teams in your school had done in the past and uh, uh, progress over that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, one more thing before we move on, uh, still on the topic of that robotics competition, first robotics competition, what is the, the mentorship system like? You, you mentioned that there were people from the community that came in to help. Uh, there were also teachers. Um, so there was a bit of mentorship. If you could say a few things about that. And also within the team itself with the students, were, was there some kind of hierarchy or would you describe that more of a flat system where everybody is helping everybody else at any given time? You could be a, a teacher and a learner. Mm-hmm. So I think um, to answer the hierarchy question first, I think there was a sort of hierarchy of experience, of course, because there are some people who had, you know, this would be their fourth year doing Mm. the program and some people who just started. And so from there, there would develop um, a a hierarchy of, you know, who is, who is spending time mentoring others and who is spending time mostly absorbing new information and and, and practicing and trying to wrap their head around it. Um, But in terms of how we actually orchestrated the work, I would say it was a lot more flat and, uh, a little bit of anarchy. I mean, it, you have to remember we were we were still just kids, and so we didn't have any formal, uh, you know, business structure or things like that. It was it was a little bit of people worked on what they were really motivated to work on. Yeah. And yeah. Different people were motivated by different things. Yeah. And yeah, we had a couple of good mentors from the community, but we also that was part of the struggle is that. Uh, You know, for my experience with this in particular, and I I know that there are other first teams who have different experiences, um, you know, just depending on the, you know, the nature of the team and who is who is sponsoring it and who is uh, organizing it. For my particular team, we, we didn't have any uh, very formally engaged sponsors who were engineering organizations. We had a few people f- who were professional engineers who could spend time on it, but it was uh, it, it was varied how much time they could spend. And so yeah. we we were a little bit scrappy in that way. We had to do a little bit of our own uh, learning things from the internet more so than having mentors who could take the time to teach us things in detail. Uh, that happened sometimes, but it didn't happen all the time. Yeah. And that is, I think, it, it was somewhat of a handicap in our ability to really deliver an excellently engineered robot, but it was also a great motivator uh, for those of us who really liked that challenge to really practice going and learning things on our own and, and finding those resources when they weren't you know, just presented to us. Yeah. So you really had to work with what you had, both from the point of view of the equipment, the technology, but also with external help and influence. So you were really in charge of the project. Absolutely. Yeah. Great. Well, uh, let's move on. What happened then? So you, you were influenced and decided by that project and then you decided to become an electrical engineer. Uh, what was that like? And like, you know, we go to university and I, in my case, I, I went to do an electrical engineering degree and I found um, most of it extremely boring. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but somehow, you know, the fire, um, remained <laughs> through that experience or was it like that for you or did you find find that experience like uh, as you expected it perhaps like uh, in terms of you know being able to create uh, interesting things with technology i think i definitely found that the the college experience wasn't what i expected in terms of just being able to play with technology all the time like you say i i found parts of it boring and parts of it to be uh, very, very tedious to get through in order to just finish and have the degree. Uh, Fortunately, I had enough experiences also in a few in a few classes and a few side projects where I actually did get to play with technology in the way that really excited me. 
and that that kept me motivated and you know kept kept me looking forward to the time when I would be through with the uh, the rote work and the, and the memorization and things like that and on on to building things. So you did have external projects. It wasn't just you know I've got to work on this project because it's like twenty five percent of my mark and then I've got the exam, so I've got no time for anything else. You did have a few projects on the side which kept your kept your curiosity and uh, you know. I guess skill set as well, making skill set alive. Yes, I, uh, I I made time for that in in whatever ways I could. I was um, and and still am very interested in in music recording and audio engineering and things like that. I actually worked as a recording engineer as as my uh, as my job when I was in school to make a little bit of money, and that uh, got me to uh, be able to play with a bunch of professional recording equipment and and sort of dig into that a little bit and so I, I on the side did a little bit of modification of audio equipment it got into you know music making things uh, guitar effects mm -hmm. pedals and things like that which uh, I could I could tinker with a, a little bit on my free time and and it didn't feel like work because I was I was getting yeah. some value out of it from the you know the music and the creativity point of view yeah it's, it's so important is it like to have a project that you feel passionate about it really keeps that spirit of of learning alive because it's like your little baby and you want you want to keep it alive so you work on it um could you tell us like is there one project that you feel that it you know past the robot the robotics project then I guess the first project that you completed as an engineer, either a trainee engineer while still in university or soon after you finished that you feel really proud of, like finally you can say that this is something that I can do uh, right now as an engineer. Is there an example like that? I think uh, the, the best example that comes to mind is actually the first thing that I worked on at my first job right out of college. Yeah. And I, was kind of thrown into this situation where, uh, so I, I was working on a signal processing system for an X-ray fluorescence analyzer. So basically, it, it's uh, measuring X-rays coming in. Uh, so there's some analog processing, and then turning that into digital information that's useful for some software somewhere else that is giving a interesting uh, analysis of of those X-rays to the customer. Hmm. So when I started at this company. I found out shortly afterwards that my boss who had designed the first prototype of the system was going to be leaving the company. <laughs> and so the first thing that I did was uh, I, I was asked to sort of dive into this and, and, and sort of pick it up and finish it. And I had no idea what I was getting into at that point, but uh, I am, I'm very proud of being able to actually pull that off because it involved having to do a lot of fast learning in a lot of different areas. Yeah. I mean, there was you know, analog circuitry, the FPGA, uh, DSP firmware, and, and things like this. And none of that I had ever really done in, in this kind of uh, commercial setting before, uh, whether in, in a hobby project or in school. And it was, it was certainly a shock to have to learn how to do all those things in the setting of not really having someone to rely on who I could always mm. ask questions and would have yeah. the answer. I, there were other engineers there, but none of them were a, a deep expert in everything. And so um, a, lot, a little bit I had to piece together on my own, a little bit I learned from other people and ended up taking that, finishing it and, and getting it into a product. And uh, I think I think that was a very good first project for me because it really uh, sort of satisfied satisfied my itch for knowing about the whole system and gave me a lot of opportunity to go out and, and learn things and and that's something that really motivates me about engineering is is learning. There's very few obstacles that are impossible to go over, right? Um, the uh, I find that this kind of baptism of fire, like I've seen it with a lot of engineers, like a f fresh out of university or college, and somebody gives them like a, a project and then leave, <laughs> leave them on their own. It's like the deep end of the pool. And I find that that's like a really transformative experience. Uh, pretty much everybody that I've spoken to that has had that kind of experience do highlight it as uh, one that 
really made a big difference in the career and their, their ability, to, their, their, their belief in themselves to go and uh, you know, build even bigger projects, stuff like that. Um, was it was it like a, a team for you or were you the, the solo developer for that uh, device? I was pretty much the solo developer of the whole system, but there were some other people that I could use as resources to talk about sort of the theory behind why why it needed to do what it did and and bounce ideas off of review designs and things like that. Yeah. So it's it's a working style that I like where I have a lot of um, personal ownership over making sure that something comes out, but I also have that support net of other engineers to to ask about, get a second opinion from, things like that. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, like, you're the kind of person that asks questions, right? Uh, like, you're not too worried about asking a stupid question, for example. What do you think about that? Oh, yeah, you, you have to get over that. I mean, <laughs> it's, a, it's a silly expression, but really when you're working on engineering, it's absolutely true that you can't think about stupid questions. You, yeah. uh, the questions that are left unasked are the ones that are going to end up, uh, you know, really getting you down the road when uh, someone yeah. says, oh, yeah, why didn't we think about that? There is no stupid question. Uh, there's only questions. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, at, at what point did open source become like an important part of your life as an engineer? So I think it's been important since the time when I wasn't even really an engineer and I was just playing with robots in terms of a resource for me. I think, you know, like I said, when we didn't have many uh, opportunities for direct learning from mentors in the robotics team, one of the ways that we learned was by using what resources we could find on the internet. Hmm. And learning the software front, um, the open source solutions that people had put out there uh, was a great resource for me for learning how to develop software and, and learning how to apply it to the robot. So from, from a very early point, I was appreciating its value as, as, a, you know, as, a, as a, someone taking it and using it. Um, I didn't really start thinking about contributing to it until later. Uh, I think that happened a few years after I, I started my first job when I happened to be working on a hobby project and one thing led to another and I ended up realizing, hey, I should actually just put this out here for other people in addition mm. to just solving mm. uh, solving the thing that I'm working on. Yeah. Uh, open source projects are really like a great educational resource. Like where else would you find complicated large projects where everything is open you can just have a look at its current state the, the whole history in some kind of uh, control and our source control system it can go back uh, all the bugs are exposed <laughs> conversations about the bugs um, the internal team dynamics uh, are all, all, all there for students people that want to learn to see that you, you can't get that kind of, um, I guess, uh, viewpoint in closed source projects. Right, yeah, and that's another reason why I'm ex excited that the open source hardware movement is, is gaining some traction <laughs> in, in recent years because uh, you know, back when I was doing the robotics things, it, it wasn't as common to be able to find uh, schematics for a for a circuit along with some good explanation of what was going on and why and the history i mean you could find a schematic for something but it was up to you to sort of interpret it and figure out the history and and figure out if you could adapt it to use with your project yeah well we'll come back to open source uh in a few minutes but i just wanted to to continue uh the thread there uh, of you now as an engineer so you had this first project i'm not sure if you're still with the same company can you give us a summary of what happens next uh in terms of you know projects that you worked on and uh, like a kind of path did your career take from that point so what i found from my uh my, my time starting at that company and and then continuing there for almost six years um hmm is that as I became more experienced with developing products and, and being involved and taking a look at what was happening at a product level in addition to what was happening at the level of whatever kind of component I was working on, um, 
I, I started getting more and more involved, not only from a technical point of view, but from a leadership point of view with, with uh, making, making the products actually a reality. Hmm. And so I, I worked on several other uh, product launches with that company where I, I was involved in some aspects of the hardware design, but I also started taking a bigger role in the project management and organizing the rest of the, the team around how we could best design the electronics and and get them ready for manufacture and things like that. So that's what led me to where I am now, which is a different company where I am the lead of the electrical engineering department. And so I am uh, taking a bigger role on the management side, as well as uh, uh, looking into technical issues where right. where necessary and, and keeping keeping my hands dirty with all the different uh, interesting electronics problems. Okay, that, that's very interesting because now what comes back to my mind is what you said about your first robotics competition um, project that way you said that you were interested in the whole system, not just the individual components. And it seems to me that that interest in the whole thing came or was carried through to what you're doing now where you are responsible for the whole product and for managing the team, all the components in it. You can, uh, Am I, am I right there? Can you see the connection Absolutely. between? Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So yes, I think it's uh, it's it's very important to me to be able to see how my the the, the things that I'm working on turn into a, a finished product, whether that's you know an open source or a commercial product, uh, to be able to see the end use and see how people are going to use it and is it going to solve their problems and how well and things like that, yeah. and having that level of understanding and then being able to pull the pieces together to try to achieve things along uh, you know that axis is important to me it helps helps me understand how to prioritize the the deeper down technical work and and you know make when uh, we're making trade-offs between different solutions and things like that it's it's a good frame of reference to have yeah well could you comment about this like there's engineers that that follow that path where they become like system oriented and a lot of them end up in a more managerial or management role like yourself. Um, there's others that become very specialized in a specific technology. So they, they go the opposite way. They don't look at the system, but they look at the component. Could you compare the two, not in a sense of who's better than, than the other, like that's not what I'm saying, but like what kind of uh, you know, thinking um, processes, I guess, or, uh, or approaches to technology would to th these two types of engineers take? And um, yeah, if you could say a few things based on your own personal experience, but also from what you see from your team. Well, I think the, the most important thing is that uh, engineering is a discipline where i think the people who succeed at it no matter what way they succeed are are motivated by something internal not just yeah. by getting paid or something like that but they get something out of that and i think different people you know their brains work differently they get motivated by different things and so that's probably part of what drives some people to specialize in a certain area and, and dig really deeply into something and, and other people to really need to have that wider view. And I think everyone only has so many resources, mental resources that they can put into the work that they're doing and what they're learning, whether it's for a hobby project or for engineering or things like that. And so people are ultimately going to be driven to spend that internal energy in, in some way or another based on the things that, are, that matter to them. And so I think the the people who really are able to dig into something and, and really get deep technically and spend a lot of time on it, um, I imagine are, are very much motivated by the desire to really understand that from top to bottom and to really dig into, okay, why, why does this do what it's doing in the circuit? Okay, what would happen if I change this? And, and, and what's the underlying theory going on here? And do we see some path to, to make a little tweak and, and get some better performance out of it or something like this? And 
it's possible to, of course, spend uh, weeks or even months on on such a rabbit hole. And I think the the curiosity there can be really important. And and ultimately, whether it's uh, curiosity or some other kind of motivation, it's something about the process that really works for you. And I think you know my my personal take is that, like I said earlier being able to see how all the pieces fit together is very motivational for me. But I also see people who, uh, you know, they, they might not want to hold all that in their mind at the same time, because instead they'd rather hold in their mind uh, that very deep look at a particular thing. And then maybe uh, every once in a while, I'll put that on a shelf and, and take something else off the shelf and go really deep in that direction. So that's uh, curiosity. Is that the word that is the, the common denominator among all engineers? I, I find scientists are the same. Like you need to be able to spend a lot of time on one topic. Um, like, can you be an engineer without that curiosity? I think that you need to be driven by something that is uh, related to curiosity. I think you you can spend time looking into a lot of different areas of engineering and and maybe per, because you're working for a company and that's the direction that the company needs you to look into. But I think that you have to be getting some kind of joy out of, yeah. out of learning and discovering because if not, you're just not going to be successful. You're not going to be able to keep up with the, the world changing around you and, and to be able to develop solutions to problems that are still relevant because I think at the end of the day, we're trying to solve problems, whether it's a, you know, a, a hobbyist project, you're trying to solve a problem for yourself or whether you're getting paid to solve someone else's problems. Uh, you need to have that curiosity in order to remember that there might always be a new way to solve the problem better and you have mm -hmm. to be on the lookout mm -hmm. for it. Yeah. So there's, there's like, you got to find the deep meaning, uh, which can be, something totally different to you know your compensation in terms of how much money you make per hour per day or whatever but that you need to find some meaning in whatever you do and it's especially true for engineers because of the you know, technology changes so fast you need to ground your work into something that uh, gives your work meaning over the long term mm -hmm. um, yeah well uh, I want to switch switch i want to switch gears now to um, a more personal question uh, out of everything that you do every day, uh, work, work-wise or contributions to open source projects, which again, we'll talk about open source in a minute. What is it that you enjoy the most? It could be technical, it could be, you know, social aspect, but what is the number one for you, if you can say number one? I would say there's, uh, there's sort of two things that come to mind and I'll try to figure out if, if one's more important than the other, but um, one of them is is being able to see the result of my work, and that can be hearing from people who are using KiCad and enjoying a new feature that I worked on, or or seeing people using a product that I helped to develop, or even something as simple as uh, seeing some of my coworkers uh, making use of a internal tool that saves 10% uh, of their time on something or some things like that. Uh, I think it's. Uh, it's very good to have that feedback loop of knowing yeah. that I'm I'm doing something positive for for someone else's life, and I think another thing is um, along the lines of of learning new things, being able to collaborate with people from whom I can learn. Uh, I'm yeah. I'm fortunate to work in an environment where I'm surrounded by amazing people to learn from, and always able to have very interesting conversations about a whole lot of different technical topics. Some of which I have very little knowledge about right now, but it's always motivational to know that I can I can start that conversation and and start down some new avenue if I want to. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So you brought in two number one things, which is fine. <laughs> I, I totally, it's, it's very hard to. To choose one, right? Um, I find just just to pitch in there one. It's just I find that from my work, like I'm asking myself now. Now I I, I also quite enjoy that those aha moments, like every now and then, where I, I finally figure out how to solve a problem that I couldn't like five minutes earlier. Something happens, and I finally get to the solution. That's the the aha moment. 
And there's a little bit of dopamine in the brain as well, I think. And that's one of the things that I guess motivates engineers to keep working for long hours on a problem because eventually they'll solve it. And that's when the, the dopamine hits <laughs> Yes, definitely. and you feel good, right? Yeah. Uh, okay. Let's flip it as, uh, on his head now. Uh, what aspect of your work don't you enjoy at all? I don't want to say hate, but you don't like. All right. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about, uh, I'll talk about my day job because, uh, I think if, if there was something that I really didn't like about working on KiCad, I could just stop doing it. Um, but I, I mostly like everything about that. Yeah. So I would say the, the, the least fun part of product development for me, and I don't, I don't really dislike it, but it's definitely the least fun for me is dealing with logistics and supply chain and things like that. Yeah. Oh, John, we've, we've lost you. Um, if you're sorry, John. Um, sorry to interrupt you. We, we lost you when you started talking about logistics. Would you be able to repeat that part? Absolutely. Uh, am, I, am I coming through okay now? Yes, yes, you can continue. Okay. So uh, if I had to pick something that uh, was really bad about product development, or at least uh, not fun compared to the other parts of it, it would be dealing with logistics and the supply chain side of, of building a product. If you're trying to build more than just a tiny production run, there's going to be just a mountain of stuff to do to get all the components in place, to get all of the right information to your manufacturing partners. It's possible to spend weeks or sometimes even months in this phase where you haven't been designing anything, you haven't been solving any engineering problems, so to speak, uh, but it's all necessary work if you want to actually produce something that, that other people can buy. And it's, it's an important part to success, but uh, it's definitely less fun than the others. And uh, when, I'm, when I'm in that situation, I just try to remember that it's a, it's a part of the cycle and it, it'll, it'll get through and, and, and there'll be more fun stuff later. Gotta do what you gotta do to get the project yeah. out there. Yeah. And as a manager, it's like one of those things. <laughs> Again, it's your responsibility. Yeah. yeah. Great. Thanks. That was a good one. Um, let's see. Um, I want to go back to open source now. So you've got your day job and it's like, it's quite a, uh, a busy job to have as well with the team and products that you've got to uh, design and then the logistics to launch them and take them to the market. But on the side, you also have KiCad and you've got a few other, uh, I think, smaller open source projects that you are also maintaining. But with KiCad, you are in the, uh, you've got, you are lead developer and you are in the, in the, uh, in the big team, I guess, <laughs> of the people that manage the whole project. I've got a few questions there, but let's start with the first one. How do you manage to have your busy uh, daytime job? and then kick out as well, which is not, like, it's not a small project. It's, it's a big one out there. Yeah. How do you manage? I would say the way that KiCad is successful is that we have enough people who are able to contribute that we can handle some variation in any one person's availability. And I myself am one of the more flaky people in terms of what my schedule looks like. I think some of our core developers have a very regular schedule in terms of when they're able to contribute to KiCad. And uh, some of the others, including me, our lives are a little bit less predictable. And so it is a challenge and it's, it's definitely something that we, we have to figure out how to plan for. I would say, it, you know, for me, it varies over the course of the year. My day job is somewhat predictable in terms of how much time I'll, I'll need to spend on that. But I also have other responsibilities some parts of the year that I, I need to focus on in addition yeah. to working on KiCad. And so sometimes I you know spend 10 or 20 hours a week uh, working on KiCad code. And wow. sometimes I will go a month without even compiling it. I, I try to at least... Uh, keep up with the discussions that happen on the mailing list and forums and things like yeah. that. Um, I, I typically spend more time on it in the winters. And so uh, it's about to be winter in, in Boston. So I'm, I'm gearing up to dive into some code, but I think it, it definitely uh, is, is true that we have uh, a number of different uh, people contributing to KiCad who have 
schedules where they sometimes can put a lot of time in and, and sometimes less time and it all it all works out but it sometimes makes it hard to predict when when a particular release will be ready yeah i guess uh being a contributor to an open source project which is not commercial right and it's not your job uh, the flexibility is built into your role so that you, you can flex up and down as you can yeah. um I, I wonder apart from contributing code and not checking into the discussion forums uh, as as a member of the lead team what are some of the other um, functions that you perform or uh, responsibilities that you have so the lead team for KiCad, and I, I want to say, you know, this, this is how KiCad is organized. And I think there are a million different ways to organize this for different open source projects. Um, we, we try to sort of set the direction of the project and figure out, um, you know, the lead team is made up of a group of developers who are both experienced enough with the project such that they can be relied on to maintain the, the standards we've put in place and, and help welcome new contributors and review their code, but also that we want to take on bigger, bigger features to put in a larger time commitment of, of code overall. And so the lead team can sort of plan around what people will be able to accomplish for a certain release. Right. We can figure out, okay, what does it make sense to do for KiCad 6, for KiCad 7, for whatever comes after that? based on how many people we have on the lead team and what each of those people is comfortable with and excited about working on and things like that. Um, you know, we do, we do have Wayne, the project lead, uh, in the, you know, sort of the, as the, uh, final arbiter of all things, KiCad, but we yeah. also try to, uh, come to a consensus uh, among the lead devs about things like, uh, you know, when we're, when we're making big decisions about the direction KiCad is going to go in, uh, it, it's sometimes helpful to have a you know a group discussion about it and figure out get get everyone's input on what what the right direction might be before we make a decision. Right. So uh, that's the job of the lead team, right? Uh, or the members will code and deal with bugs and stuff like that. But the main responsibility is to plan for the future of the project through discussions. I would say that yeah. that's one responsibility and another very important one is to make KiCad a, a welcoming place for new developers. Right. So helping to set the tone of the discussion, uh, keep, uh, like have a positive tone and and help to uh, you know make make less frequent contributors have a good experience uh, by you know giving helpful feedback and reviewing their patches and and getting them merged. It can take a lot of time to deal with a lot of patches coming in and so by having more people on the lead developer team uh, we're, we're, we're trying to make it so that the, the time that it takes for some contribution to get reviewed is lower and and people can expect that they they will actually get uh, get their code looked at and have a have an honest review right interesting point because so that the future of any open source project is not just how much code is getting written or rewritten but also managing the people and constantly bringing in new people as there is attrition i guess people have lives and they move on but you need to replace them and then uh, bring on new people as well to to um, ensure that the continuity of the project and that again is the respons responsibility of the lead team right Right. Yes, we yeah. we ideally create an environment where those people uh, will will come in and find it to be a project that they enjoy contributing to and develop a relationship with the other developers and you know those kinds of people who then continue to to uh, ramp up their contribution are are the people who get invited to join the lead team. A uh, quick question. So we, inside the lead team, how do you have these conversations? Is it like face-to-face -face or video conference or through an um, email list? Uh, and is it public or is it just between you? Uh, we, we've tried a lot of different uh, methods. I think we, we mostly communicate via email and forums. Um, there's, uh, we, you know, we try to do a lot of things out in the open every once in a while, there'll be a, you know, a private thread. If, if people want to, uh, discuss, discuss the particulars of a solution before, before it's fully baked, sometimes it's good to, yeah. uh, 
to do those to just to uh, brainstorm things and put together something that we're all happy with um, before before it becomes public. Um, but we often will just discuss things on the public mailing list. Yeah. We have gotten together a few times for face to face meetings. Uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to going over to uh, Fostum uh, in, in Belgium next year and meeting a lot of the KiCad team again. Uh, last I met in the uh, KiCon conference in Chicago. Yeah. So we occasionally get those times to meet up and we're, we're planning on making good use of it. Face-to-face uh, -face time is really helpful. And so we've, we've set aside some time after the conference to just spend a few days uh, really uh, uh, brainstorming and working together and, and trying to, to have a really productive time of it while we're all in the same room. Yeah, and uh, KeyCon 2020, I think, has been announced a couple of weeks ago at CERN in Switzerland. Yes, right? I'm so you'll be having, to... yeah, I'll try to make it too. So, like, it's like both KeyCon is something I want to do and CERN. <laughs> I want to go see CERN and the Super Collider. So, it's a perfect opportunity. So, then you, we spend a bit of time, the, the, the core team will spend a bit of time to, to plan after that. So, it's a good opportunity. Uh, Okay, uh, I've got uh, a couple of questions left. Uh, mm -hmm. One very important question has to do with technology, of course. Now, when I was a kid, I was watching Star Trek and there were things like the replicator, uh, which magically would make anything appear, <laughs> including tea, <laughs> um, the transporter, things like that. Like, is there something that you wish like some kind of piece of technology that you wish you could have in your pocket or your backpack that you expected it to be true today, but isn't for some reason? Well, uh, going from the Star Trek theme, I'm really looking forward to the tricorder. I mean, being able to pull out a device and yeah. scan basically anything and get interesting information would be great. The first product I worked on was actually kind of like that, but it could only tell you the material makeup of, of something. Um, yeah. More realistically, I'm excited about the prospects of uh, personal medical devices. Yeah. Uh, you know, we see the Apple Watch now as an EKG and can tell you things about what's going on with your heart. So I'm really excited to see in five or 10 years where this goes with uh, you know, people being able to have some kind of device on them that can tell them what's going on with their health, what's going on with their body, like diagnosing illnesses and things like that. I think that's going to be great. Yeah, I actually finished reading a book uh, on, not, not on this topic, but it had some elements of that uh, where, you know, medical devices and a medical tricorder, but the one that the book was talking about was actually an implant, uh, would automatically detect, you know, various parameters of um, your body's operation. And in real time, it would send some information to your phone saying, hey, you need a little bit more of this or that or the other. So eat this or that or reduce that and things like that. So it's like you had a, a doctor in your pocket in a way. Uh, you'd, n you'd never need to do another blood test <laughs> and wait for a week for the results because that would happen. Yeah. I, I'm also looking forward to that. I think uh, it, what do you say? Five to 10 years? I'm, I'm hopeful that we'll see more of those in, in five years. I, I mm. think there are a number of breakthroughs that still need to happen to make that a possibility, but I, I've seen some interesting startups in this area. I've, I've heard about some interesting prospects. So I'm, I'm just excited for it to become more common. You know, I think Apple putting it into a consumer product is going to be an interesting catalyst there. People are starting to think about it more, uh, just starting with the easy things like, uh, like using a sensor to look at um, you know, what's going on with the blood near your skin or what's going on yeah. with your heart rate. Um, I think there are more interesting sensors out there that could be available to people, but we haven't yet done the work needed to make it affordable, reliable, and, and um, distributed to everyone rather than being just something that's at a doctor's office or a hospital. Yeah, the, the, like anything that crosses niches and industries, like you've got a computer company digging into the territory of the medical establishment. And it's just one example, there's, there's a lot of tension in between. So it's also the political issues rather than just the technological that have to be sorted out. But I think eventually, like we've seen in the past, they do. And uh, there's the benefits are enormous. So five years, okay. Well, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know we'll have the full tricorder in five years, but 
I, I imagine they'll have some interesting products. I, I know that the industry has been, uh, you know, there's there's been some uh, cases of, of bad situations where people made promises that just weren't true about devices yeah. like this. Hmm. Um, and I think it's it's a tricky one because improving people's health is such an important field. It's going to put a lot of people into uh, looking for solutions and sometimes looking too hard and, and coming up with solutions that aren't actually solutions. But yeah. I still think it's an important area for research. Yeah. Um, another example is uh, the um, di diabetics. Uh, and uh, there's millions of diabetics that have to do uh, like inject insulin every day. So put a syringe in your arm a, few, a couple of times a day and then check your blood uh, again by puncturing your skin. Oh, that sounds very radical, but uh, I guess that a device like that, that, that its single purpose would be to measure your ECG plus your glucose level. That's a huge step forward. And then there's so many other things you can measure and uh, report. All right, Absolutely. great. Thank you. Um, okay, uh, John, um, let's say that a new engineer or a, a person that is about to become a new engineer asks you for advice. What would you say? Well, uh, other than the, the bit we already talked about, about always keep learning, I think one piece of advice I would have is to approach everything you're working on, whether it's big or small, as an opportunity to excel. You can always find opportunities to go above the bare minimum on a project. And I think if you're strategic about it, you could get a couple of advantages from this. Uh, you know, first of all, obviously, if you you know if you go above and beyond what someone asked you to do, they're probably going to be happy with you. You know, it's going to help your career yeah. growth. But also, it's an opportunity for you to guide your own learning. So, you know, one example would be if you are given a task to do and you realize, oh, this is repetitive. I you know, I'm doing the same thing over and over again. I could automate it with some kind of a script. Maybe you can do it 10 times faster. So now you can get the work done and you can also deliver the script and say, hey, I can show other people how to use this script um, and, and everyone's happy. Plus, in addition to doing that work, you got to practice your scripting skills. So yeah. there won't always be such an obvious opportunity like that. I mean, that's a little bit of a, like a movie scene version of, of that advice. But we all sometimes have work to do that isn't fun because it's, you know, it's, it's not quite what we wish we'd be working on, but it, it's what's needed to get the project done. And sometimes you just have to get it done and get through it. But sometimes it's an opportunity to say, you know, hey, how can I get this done and also go above and beyond, learn a little bit extra myself and, and really just uh, show my boss or whoever that I'm, I'm sort of really committed to this, even though it's yeah. like not that excited a task. Yeah, um, I think that's good advice. Always try to do a little better than what's expected of you, uh, because you know your, your own expectations of yourself very often are guided by what other people expect of yourself. So if you're lucky enough to have somebody that expects more of yourself, they can push you forwards, you're lucky. You know, most of us, don't have such a person they just ask for a and they expect a but if you give a plus <laughs> that's uh that's a benefit for all of us right um i remember i think in my first job out of um engineering i was writing software i was working for a document company and we had a lot of xml and my boss pretty much every day had a new project for me that would get me out of my job <laughs> and that had to do with automation so he, he'd asked me to write a script to automate that and this and the other so that i wouldn't have to do it manually anymore so he called that get yourself out of the job <laughs> and i'd happily do it because i liked automation so yeah there you go all right um i think that's about it thank you very much john that was um a really uh, like pleasant last hour and um like getting an insight on the life of a real engineer and their evolution is always very inspiring to others so thank you for making the time thank you peter it's always nice to talk to you great